I know that this time of the year is the time for New Year's resolutions. Um, the, the top New Year's resolutions, um, I, I looked this up, and so the top New Year's resolutions are what you think they would be. Um, lose weight, exercise more, save some money, um, quit smoking made the list, uh, spend more time with my family and friends, travel more, read more, learn a new skill. These are the most common New Year's resolutions. Uh, for followers of Jesus, uh, I've learned that what usually makes the list for them too is some type of spiritual discipline. I'm going to read my Bible more, or I'm going to pray more, or I'm going to serve more, or do more. Um, the emphasis of all these New Year's resolutions um, follow along these lines. I'm going to try harder to do something. Uh, I'm going to do more. I'm going to do less of something. Maybe it's I'm going to eat less food so I can uh, lose my weight goals. I'm going to stop something or I'm going to start doing something. Like resolutions are wired that way, right? They're wired that way because we're wired that way. As humans, we are wired toward stop, start, do, don't. That's how we're wired. We're hardwired um, to, to think and to process and to, we are programmed to perform as humans. By the way, if you didn't get a Mark um, journal, they're on the back table. Um, they cost us $6. It's a page of text, blank page, if you want to journal your way through the Mark series. If you don't have the six bucks, you can still get one. Um, if you do have the six, just throw in the offering for that. Um, hopefully you have one. I don't even care if you need it and want to get up and go get it now. Um, you're welcome to do that. I won't point you out. Unless you're certain people, I might point you out. Um, but we are programmed to perform. We are wired to perform and to please and to do more, try hard, stop, do more, more, less, less. We're in a new series through the Gospel of Mark, which begins with these words. And we're only going to cover the first verse today. And I know you're thinking like, man, if we only get through one verse at a time, we're going to be in this thing for years. Um, which wouldn't be the first time we were in a gospel for years. Um, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Beginnings are crucial. Here's some famous opening lines, beginning lines of recognized famous novels in American literature. First three words of this novel are call me Ishmael. Anybody know what that is? Moby Dick. Herman Melville's Moby Dick. How about this one? It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. Charles Dickens, Tale of Two Cities. Here's one that's a little tricky, but you might recognize it. He was an old man who fished alone in a skiff in the Gulf Stream, and he had gone 84 days now without taking a, no one knows that, a fish. The old man and the sea, Ernest Hemingway, famous beginnings. Maybe the last one's not so famous based on the response. If you are a reader or you enjoy reading like I am, um, then you will notice, this is the book I'm reading right now, which by the way, if you read Gentle and Lowly last year that I recommended, bam, this right here is what you need to read next. Uh, same author and along the same lines. And so beautiful, beautiful book. Um, this book, Deeper, written by Dane Ortland. Uh, when I open the pages to this book, I usually skip a little bit because I know what's going to be in it, right? Um, there's going to be recommendations. So these are recommendations by Paul Miller, Matt Chandler, and J.D. Greer, and Scotty Smith. There's a title page. Um, there is the, what ha this is a book that's within a series. So the other titles of the series books are listed here. There's the information, the name of the book, subtitle, um, author. There's publishing material, which I don't know why we put in publishing material, when it was published, who published it. I never read all the fine print of when this happened. There's a dedication page that comes next. And then there's uh, just, a, just kind of a quote that he's building the, the book upon. And then there's a table of contents. Again, kind of going to tell me what's going to be in the book. There's a series preface that tells me all about the series that this book is a part of. There's a book preference. There's an introduction. There's even a list of abbreviations that might be used in the book. 
You know why we have all of that in the beginning of books is because we have an abundance of paper. You can put all that stuff in and not have to worry about it. If you're a first century writer, author, you don't have an abundance of paper. As a matter of fact, you are writing usually in some type of scroll or papyrus or something that's going to get passed around to a lot of people. And so you get really short and you get really to the point. And so when you read a lot of first century literature, even the scriptures, the New Testament authors will often capture their entire narrative, their entire story, their entire book in one summary sentence, one paragraph. And that's what Mark gives us. Mark the earliest of the four church books about Jesus that we call the Gospels. Uh, they're not necessarily in chronological order, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Most New Testament scholars believe Mark came first. Uh, so Mark, the earliest of the four church books about Jesus, offers a summary of the entire account of the life of Jesus with one simple statement. The beginning of the good news of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. It's important as we dive into this series to break down this synopsis of what Mark has to say. That word gospel, you hear that a lot at City Church. The original word of gospel is um, evangelion, which is often, most often translated gospel or means good news. We identify that word, that New Testament word, with the good news regarding who Jesus is, what he has done, the gospel of Jesus Christ. First century readers would have rooted that word, evangelion, they would have rooted that word in political overtones. Because that word had to do with the proclamation of something important in the kingdom. Announcement of a new king or ruler. A strategic victory over an enemy. Proclaimers, gospel announcers, evangelion bearers, they would run into the marketplace, into county square. There wasn't Twitter. There wasn't the internet. There wasn't local news or national news to watch. They were proclaimers. So they would announce in public places the good news. A victory has been won. A new king is in place. A new ruler has been born. And so Mark utilizes this very well-known word to say there's good news. There's an announcement taking place. I have an agenda to announce the beginning of the story of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And this is a good news proclamation that his story, this story, Mark's story, will be read aloud, it will be announced, it will be circulated in all these local gatherings of first century Jesus followers. And so every word in this opening sentence, this opening paragraph, this preamble, every word is important as Mark alerts his hearers of the significance of this story. It's the good news of the gospel. And this story follows kind of three very important ideas of how this story of Jesus collides with three other stories that were happening in Mark's context. Let me, and that we find throughout all of the book of Mark. Uh, these stories have to do with Eden, Israel, and Rome. Okay, so let me break those down. Mark says this is the beginning of the gospel. You might recognize that word beginning. Popular word in scripture. Genesis 1.1. In the what? Beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That word beginning takes our minds back to Eden. The word beginning recalls the opening words of scripture. God's redemptive story. In the beginning. In the garden of Eden. Eden represents God's beautiful and deliberate creation of the world, his creation of humanity. Eden is a beginning. It's the beginning of all beginnings, you could say. It is a beginning. It's the initiation of this harmonious relationship that existed between God and humans, humans with each other, Adam and Eve, God and humanity. And so in the beginning, when God initiated all things, he brought humanity into existence in this harmonious relationship. And Eden represents that. But Eden also reminds us that this original relationship, this harmonious relationship between God and humans, humans and each other, is ruined, right? It was ruined in Genesis chapter 3 when our sin disrupts 
God's original design. In essence, God created and we decreated. We uncreated what God declared good in Genesis 1 and 2. Sin damages the relationship and introduces guilt and shame and corruption and rebellion and violence and death into the story. But the good news, the gospel announcement, is that God does not give up on us. God does not walk away from us. Instead, we read Genesis 3, but within Genesis 3, there is woven the story of redemption and reconciliation from Genesis 3 forward. God promises a rescuer is coming. A Messiah will be born who will restore the broken relationship, who will take us back to Eden. One of my favorite songs from the artist uh, David Crowder is Back to Eden. It's a reminder that God will bring us back to Eden. Eden, back into that mended, redeemed, restored relationship. And through this promised rescuer, through this promised Messiah, what was created and then decreated will be recreated in that final episode, right? And in all of heaven and all of eternity when Eden is restored to its original state. And so Mark's narrative, Mark's gospel, Mark's story is Filled with Old Testament references, Old Testament symbols, as he announces Jesus is the promised rescuer who restores this harmonious relationship between God and humans and humans with each other. Beginning takes us to Eden. Mark uses a second important word here. He says, Jesus Christ. Christ reminds us of the story of Israel. Of Israel. Next week, we'll go into the opening scene of Mark's gospel, beginning of verse 2. And this opening scene in Mark's account reminds us that God's people are anticipating. They are waiting for the fulfillment of God's promises. They are longing desperately for salvation. Now, when we think of salvation... Uh, we think in terms of kind of this personal forgiveness of sins, gift of eternal life. That's not necessarily the salvation that uh, the Israelites were anticipating in their day and age. What they were anticipating was not just the forgiveness of sins, but the kind of this socio-political, economic liberation from, from Rome, um, from their captors. That's what they were looking for. They were looking to be set free politically, kind of an earthly kingdom. For centuries, God's people have been desperate for release and renewal and redemption for God in their minds to establish an earthly kingdom through a promised Messiah. Now, we'll learn very quickly when we dive into Mark's narrative that Jesus is not the type of Messiah that they are anticipating. He's not the type of Messiah that they want, but he is the Messiah they need. He is the Messiah their hearts long for. He is the fulfillment of God's promises. So again, numerous Old Testament references remind Mark's audience the good news of the kingdom of God is initiated by Jesus. Mark quotes prophets like Isaiah who use this terminology, good news. He used that language when prophesying of a coming Messiah who will bring peace and salvation and deliverance and release from oppression. And right out of the gate, Mark reminds us in his good news proclamation, Jesus is that Messiah. Jesus is the Christ. Christ is not the last name of Jesus. Christ is a title. Christ means Messiah. He is the fulfillment of everything God's been writing, the story that God has been writing through this chosen people, Israel. He is the promised one who will fulfill the redemptive promises of God. So we have Eden, this beginning. We have Israel, Jesus, the Christ. But Mark is writing to Romans, to Christians who live in the Roman Empire, Jew and Gentile Christians living in the Roman Empire. And so he reminds us of the story of Rome with this title, Son of God. Jesus is the Son of God, Mark says. He makes his good news announcement to Jesus' followers living in Rome. 
And they're living in Rome in, mid, in the mid to late 60s. I'm not talking about the 1960s. Some of you like 1960s. Conrad's bringing back the 1960s haircut. <laughs> Proud of it too. I'm not talking about the 1960s. How about the mid to late 60s? Like no, nothing in front of the 60. <laughs> A.D. 60, about 30 years after Jesus was around. Let me tell you what's going on in Rome. Rome is under the control of a tyrant named Nero. He rules his empire with abuse. He strikes terror and fear into the hearts of the citizens. He wreaks havoc on the poor. He overtaxes anyone that has a competing income with him to show that he's in absolute control. And by A.D. 64, Nero's losing control. He's losing control of his empire. But he's a madman. He's crazy. And so this deranged ruler responds to his empire spiraling out of control by setting fire to his own city. He sets fire to his own the city and destroys three quarters of Rome. And to regain favor with the Roman citizens who are scratching their heads about this new movement of people who claim to follow this weird Messiah from Nazareth, to regain control and the loyalty of the Roman citizens, he blames the Christians for the crime that he committed, for setting fire to his own kingdom. Nero blames followers of Jesus. The Roman historian Tacitus reports that Christians at that time began to experience severe persecution. Many are dressed in the skins of wild animals and they're fed to lions and other beasts. History tells us that thousands of Jesus followers during that time are crucified. They are used as human torches to light the darkened pathways into the empire of Rome. Christians in the Roman Empire live with this constant threat of persecution, potential martyrdom of giving their lives for Christ. So when we use language like to embrace Jesus as Lord, what that meant for the readers of Mark's gospel, for the followers in the first century was this, to embrace Jesus as Lord is to reject and denounce Nero as Lord. As a Roman citizen, it was my obligation to say, Nero is Lord. Nero is King. Caesar is God. These were obligations of Roman citizens, including Christians living within the Roman Empire. For a Christian to denounce Nero as Lord and to announce Jesus as Lord was to put their life on the line. And into this context, Mount Mark announces, good news proclamation, Jesus is the Son of God. There is one true King. And what we'll learn in Mark's gospel is that this writer will say, look, following Jesus, life-threatening, dangerous. It requires pledging allegiance and devotion to Jesus as King of kings, Lord of lords. Following him, Mark will say, is taking up your cross every day and dying to yourself. And what that meant for the hearers of Mark's gospel is that might mean literally dying, being martyred, persecuted, suffering. But following him, Mark will tell us, is the only path. It's the only path to eternal life. Eden, Israel, Rome. These three ongoing stories that collide with God's redemptive story. A story that finds its fulfillment in Jesus, the Christ, the Son of God. A story that 2,000 years later collides with our story. People in need of a Savior, in need of a Redeemer, in need of a Rescuer. You see, the story of Jesus is more than a good story. It is a confession of faith. It is an announcement of good news. It is a proclamation of who he is. It is a declaration that I will follow him no matter the cost. Mark's all about beginnings. Now, don't get me wrong here. 
Mark is not about New Year's resolution, try harder beginnings. He is about the beginning of the good news of who Jesus is, what he has done, and what it means to follow him. You see, in Jesus, God initiates something new. Something grounded in previous stories of sin and rebellion and God's redemptive pursuit of his people, but something new. A story that ends differently. A story of final redemption and deliverance and salvation. A good news announcement to people in need of new beginnings. To people in need of new beginnings. It is a story, by the way, written by Mark, a person in need of a new beginning. Let me tell you why. Most New Testament scholars and historians believe that the Gospel of Mark was written by a man named John Mark. Let me tell you who John Mark is. John Mark is the Jewish son of a woman named Mary in whose house the early church gathered in Jerusalem. So he's got some heritage there. So church begins to form and gather in homes. The mother of Mark is one of the homes in which the Christians would gather in Jerusalem. Some believe it was possibly even the site of the Lord's Supper. They also believe it is where when Peter, and you'll have to have a little bit of biblical knowledge for this one. Remember when Peter was in prison and the angel came and was like, you're coming out of here and like opened the doors and all the soldiers are like, what's happened? And Peter goes to where the Christians are gathered and praying for him and knocks on the door. You read this story in Acts? And the little girl shows up and is like, Peter's out here. Like, we've been praying for Peter, and she doesn't let him in. Instead, she runs back and is like, Peter's out here. It's either Peter or a ghost. They're like, why didn't you open the door? So where Peter runs is John Mark's house. The home of Mary, the mother of Mark. John Mark only appears in association with more prominent personalities. Most people believe that Mark is actually the story of Peter being told through Mark. That Mark is kind of interpreting Peter, the disciple, and so he's the interpreter of Peter. He's also, let me bring this full circle for you, he's also, we learn in the New Testament, an assistant to Paul and Barnabas on their very first missionary journey. And what I mean by assistant is like he was their servant, is actually the word there. That means like he was in charge of the agenda. He booked the hotels and the flights, flying donkeys, you know, first century. He was the assistant to Paul and Barnabas on the first missionary journey. And if you know the story, you know that John Mark deserts the missionary team. He bails on them and he causes this huge rift, this split between Paul, right? I mean like the Paul and Barnabas, who, by the way, is the cousin of John Mark. So Barnabas is like, I'm going family here, Paul. I know you're like all that, church planner, famous, all those things, but I'm sticking with family. And so he causes this rift between first century Paul, church planner, wrote half the New Testament, and Barnabas, who, by the way, his nickname was son of encouragement. A decade later, A decade later, 10 years, we discover that Mark has been reconciled with Paul. The final New Testament reference we have of John Mark is he is ministering alongside Peter in Rome. That's in 1 Peter 5. Church tradition tells us that Mark takes the gospel after serving alongside Paul and Peter He takes the gospel to Egypt and eventually becomes a pastor in the city of Alexandria. Here's the point. Mark is a follower of Jesus who knows what it is like to need a fresh start. A new beginning. Again and again. He's the voice of Peter, who by the way, was always in constant need of a fresh start. If you know Peter's story, right? He's the voice of Peter. He deserted Paul. He serves in the shadows while other people take a more prominent role. 
many scholars believe that there's this like weird verse in chapter 13, verse 51, when they come to take Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. And there's this weird verse where there's this young man who runs out of Gethsemane naked. Many New Testament scholars believe that young man, Mark, that was there witnessing the whole thing. That's Mark. A writer, a new, a new a first century follower of Jesus who is in constant need of fresh starts and new beginnings. And beginnings are grounded in the gospel. In the account of Jesus that Mark gives us, he constantly highlights the unexpected. Jesus says things we would not expect him to say. He responds in ways that catch us off guard. We will learn a lesson as we go through Mark's gospel and we will learn it well that Jesus is not confined to human expectations. He's not confined to our preconceived notions of who he should be. Mark moves through the story of Jesus at almost a breakneck speed. He uses the word immediately over 40 times in his gospel. There's an urgency with which he writes and proclaims the good news of Jesus. Here's what I love about Mark's gospel. Except for two brief inserts about John the Baptist. We'll see one of them next week. Every story in Mark's gospel is about Jesus. Every story. He's the center of attention. Jesus is a man of action. He is a man of compassion. We learn as much about Jesus from what he does in Mark's gospel as by what he says. And we are invited into the story. We're invited into the story in two primary ways. One, to know who Jesus is. We call it Christology, the story of the study of Jesus. We are invited to know who Jesus is. And we are invited to know what it means to follow him. We call it discipleship. Know who Jesus is. Know what it means to follow him. No matter if you're in the first century Rome, living under the threat of being fed to wild animals, no matter if you're in the first century church just trying to figure out what all this means to follow this Messiah, this crucified Messiah, no matter if you are sitting in Decatur, Alabama in 2020. Two, what does it mean to follow Jesus in everyday life based on who he is, based on what he has done, what he proclaims? What does it mean to be a follower and a disciple of Jesus in everyday life? You see, Mark writes as a pastor to people facing intense persecution and he announces to them, God is a God of new beginnings, not by trying harder, not by New Year's resolutions, not by doing better, not by stopping and starting in all the ways that we try to measure it. He is a God of new beginnings based on an announcement of who Jesus is and what Jesus has done, that what he has done is enough for you. Mark is not just a book. It is a good news announcement, a proclamation of the redemptive story of salvation in Jesus. It is good news found in a person, and that person is Jesus, and he is the Christ, and he is the Son of God. And here's what excites me about this series. Mark overturns our assumptions and our expectations about Jesus. And he confronts us with our tendency to downplay Jesus, to domesticate him, to reduce Jesus to junior varsity status, to put him down on our level. Mark confronts us as we live life with a Jesus who makes us comfortable, with a Jesus who is predictable, and if we're honest, a Jesus who's a little bit boring, because we got all the stories down. Mark challenges our sanitized versions of Jesus and he invites us into this deeper relationship with Jesus not based on what we do but based on who he is and what he has done. 
He invites us to follow Jesus. But he says to us, no, that this is a journey that is shaped by a cross. That Jesus is on the move and his kingdom purposes leave the comfortable and the complacent behind. That following him is not for the lazy, it's not for the pretentious, it's not for the self-righteous. But it is for those who need a new beginning. It is for sinners, for failures, for rejects, for nobodies. It is a good news announcement for those who have come to the end of themselves. Real sinners in need of real rescue. Not by trying harder or making spiritual resolutions. But people who need the gospel. Does versus done. Not what we do or do not do, but what he has already done. Mark tells the story of Jesus in a way that convinces his readers. A crucified Messiah is worth following. While also recognizing following Jesus is difficult and it might be life-threatening. The good news is not for the faint of heart. Mark asks tough questions. He highlights those who do not understand the strange God-man named Jesus. He spotlights those who are afraid of, of Jesus' uncanny powers. He highlights those who abandon Jesus and betray Jesus. He highlights those who are burned out and washed out and who weep over their failures and sins. And he highlights these stories because they're his story. It's the story of his mentor. His mentor's story sounds compellingly similar to the stories found in Mark's gospel. He highlights these stories because these are the types of people who follow Jesus. These are the type of people who were loved by Jesus and who loved Jesus. These are the types of people who are sinful, desperate people in need of a great Savior. These are people like you, people like me. Are you in need of a fresh start going into 2022? Are you in need of a new beginning? From a gospel perspective, I want to encourage you today. It doesn't come through resolving to try harder in your spiritual life. It doesn't come by doing more, or trying less, or whatever it looks like for you. I want to invite you on a journey, a journey to discover fresh who Jesus is, and what it means to follow him. And what we will discover on this journey is Jesus is greater than we ever imagined. He's greater because he is enough for you. He's enough. He is more than enough for you. Whatever fresh start, new start, sin you're trying to overcome, battle you're having, he's more than enough for you. What he has done is more than enough. Welcome to the Gospel of Mark. A story about Jesus for you and for me.